All right, welcome back to This Is A True Podcast. Um, I'm Tyler. I'm Daniel. And uh, we have a very special guest today. Uh, he played Lionel Happy Holloway on this season of Fargo. Uh, please welcome Edwin Lee Gibson. Woo. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> stop. No, go on. <laughs> Go on, stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just a huge thank you again. Um, just a little background. Uh, you've been commenting on our, uh, our on our podcast for a while, and uh, it's finally great that uh, that we got to just set this up and uh, have have something fun. Just just first question, just starting off, like how long uh, have you been listening to our podcast? I'm just curious. Um, a little bit. It was what was funny was that. Um, I said I wouldn't watch any of the uh, of the episodes until they were all on, uh, on aired. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't watch them until well prior prior to, prior to, to, to my character coming on. Mm-hmm. And so you all were kind of my uh, <laughs> you you were my guilty pleasure. Of, <laughs> uh, each week I was like, oh, so okay, well you know this is going on on the sh- on the show because of um, um, because. I wanted to be there, but I didn't really want to jump too uh, uh, quickly into like looking at what the story was. Um, so yeah, so I, I came across you guys, and I was just following you the, the entire time. That's awesome. I mean, it's it's funny because like when that. yeah, <laughs> when we started, we kind of were like, oh, we don't want to make it as long as the episodes, but a lot of our episodes kind of turned out to be like an hour or so. Right. Um, so in, in a way, you were watching the episode, except you. <laughs> you were hearing our recap instead of the beautiful uh, cinematography by like Noah Hawley and team. Anyways, uh, jumping into the first actual uh, question, uh, just take us through like the process of auditioning for Fargo. Uh, we know uh, it was like ma- mainly Chicago based. There were a lot of Chicago based actors in it. One of my friends was telling me she has a friend in it, uh, James uh, Vincent Meredith. Uh, she knows him. Um, but uh, just yeah, just walk us through the process uh, of auditioning for Lionel Happy Holloway and uh, how do you how you landed it? Yeah, um, I was doing a play in Boston last year at Arts Emerson, and um, I got from my my agent is in Chicago. Uh, I worked there in the theater a bit, and I also did some some uh, some TV work, you know, on the um, Chicago because my my agent is there. And so uh, people think I'm from Chicago, but I'm from really no place. My last address was in Paris. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, Amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but, um, but I read for the role one night after a show or after rehearsal or something like that and uh, sent it in. Now, my, my manager is in L.A. He told me that I'd read for Fargo a couple of times. Of course, so many things. You just keep doing them and you mm-hmm. put them away. Um, but this time, um, my agent in Chicago sent this and I read for him and again, I just kind of put it away. Um, uh, I enjoyed it. I, I, re- I remember thinking, wow, this is really, really cool character. But I also saw in the description that he was supposed to be a really big guy, <laughs> you know, oh, um, um, so I was like, well, you know, let's fill up the screen and see what they say. Right. Uh, um, and um, that was really it and uh, after the play I went out to LA for a pilot season and about five days after I got there uh, I got a phone call saying um, you know they want you to check your uh, availability for the the role and uh, I was supposed to shoot it in March but <laughs> a, week before, a week before you know uh, uh, the entire world changed right so, yeah Yes, Wait. but that's really what the whole uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the whole process was. That's super interesting. So, ju- just like going off that, so that means you shot during the pandemic, right? No, actually, um, um, we didn't get around to shooting those last two episodes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, I'm not giving any secrets away because it was mm-hmm. in all of the um, uh, the magazines, like, um, uh, you know, um, the COVID. Uh, uh, pandemic really kind of shut down everything. And I was supposed to travel back out to Chicago to a shoot and, uh, never got to go out in, in March. Yeah. 
uh, then went to Chicago and we shot in uh, August and September. Oh, wow. That's that's pretty. Yeah, that's a that's, very quick yeah. turnaround on the edit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Luckily, those are the last two episodes, I think. So, you know, they had the other ones in the in the, in the can. So just going off of that, though, I'm curious, like how the production was coming at that time of the year. Like how different was that given the, the COVID restrictions? And they did such a great job uh, on that production on that set you know we tested every other day Mm -hmm. um and the way it was run you know the uh precision you know how they did it you know there was never it was never crowded there were no long lines to get tested you know people but but everyone was 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 getting tested and um they did a phenomenal job with that uh uh you know kudos to them and to even going into uh hair and makeup and um uh um, um and uh, uh jr in uh costumes you know everything was just done so well that's something this season that has been really remarkable just the 50s vibe and like the feeling of of just fargo in the kansas city in the 1950s is so good with the costumes this season like it's <laughs> it's crazy yeah it was, it was good um, 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 and, to, and, to, and, to, and to, to do all that in Chicago, to find those locations yeah, um, was really, really amazing. Uh, uh, Oak Park, uh, I don't know if you know much about Chicago, but uh, there's an area, uh, Oak Park, which is out west on the uh, Green Line and um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. You know all those homes that that, that, that uh, he created, all that architecture. Mm-hmm. You see that in the those those are the neighborhoods that they shot in, and um, yeah, it was just really uh, they created such a really really great look. Yeah, it definitely creates this immersive world that really was a big reason why we love the show so much this season. And I think that also speaks to with my next question, which is about like how much did you know about Fargo, the the show, the universe, the world. And, and Noah Hawley before you got the job? Or was it really just like a, just an audition for another project? Uh, well, uh, it was a special audition because, you know, I'm a, I've loved the Coen brothers since I saw the original um, uh, Fargo. And uh, I actually had the chance to work with uh, Francis uh, in the theater in uh, New York mm-hmm. once um, on a uh, piece. Uh, but I've always loved them. And so then when the entire series came out and, the woman who, who was the uh, the uh, the lead in season one, uh, worked with her on a short uh, lived um, uh, ABC show. Allison uh, Tomlin, right? Tolman, yeah. Tolman, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, she, she's just wonderful. So, so I knew about the um, meeting her. I went back and saw season one. And that's how I really got into the the, uh, the uh, universe, and then seeing uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, Bokeem, like, you know, really kind of kill uh, Mike Milligan. Yeah. Yeah. We're big Bokeem guys. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I'm a good, good dude. I don't, I don't know him. I met him once many years ago in New York, but I don't know him. Um, and uh, so it was, it was pretty special. And, you know, and, and I was really aware of kind of how, how they like to shoot things. And there's a way they have like these special, they have these angles that they like to use. So I wanted to really kind of go in and uh, not try to do that, but just be uh, aware of that. Uh, You know, I I think, I think there's a, there's a, like there's a Shakespearean acting or there's a a Wilsonian, August Wilson, Wilsonian acting. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, I think there's a Fargonian acting as well. Uh, that's that's really no, totally, interesting because yeah. that's exactly what I was going to ask you next. When when I watch things like uh, like a David Lynch movie, I'm always wondering if the actors in a David Lynch project know that they're in a David Lynch project. And the same thing for for like a Coen Brothers project. I was wondering if how aware you were of that as like an actor, and if that informed the performance at all, or if you just had to sort of divorce that and just treat the character as a character. Yeah, it was it was actually a bit of both. I mean, you you know it going in, but you don't want to play it. Mm. You know, you just want to be aware of certain things. Um, um, my kind of process when I'm doing uh, 
TV or film work, especially TV work, is that when they're doing the setups, I I go and I stand behind uh, the uh, monitors. Mm-hmm. I actually watch the setups, and I, and I, I run my lines as I'm watching the setup, as I'm watching mm-hmm. you know what they're doing with the cameras and what and what everything what's happening, even if the camera's not on me, you know. So I'm always watching that, and it's something special about watching as an actor, just like kind of watching the setups happen um, with the seconds in and even with them just uh, uh, working the camera. I mean, you guys are filmmakers, you know what I'm talking about. And so then when, so then when I get back in, when I get back into place, I'm not worried about what this is going to be and what that is going to be uh, because I'm, because I, because I already, because, because I've already seen what they wanted and uh, someone like uh, <laughs> Sylvain White, uh, who's just, you know, that dude there is funny. Uh, you know, he's really, really brilliant. And they're just so cool and easy with it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I speak a little bit of French and, you know, he's from France, you know, he's from <laughs> Paris. Uh, and so we got to speak a little French. Of course, mine is really, really terrible. And he was really, really cool. uh, yeah, uh, but but just someone, you know, w- with that, that has that kind of artistry, you know, um, it helps you when you get back in front of the camera. So you can just kind of uh, do the work. So it's not just like another show for me. I think Fargo is really special. Um, There's a way that, that, that they do things that I, you know, wanted to just kind of, uh, you know, participate in, you know, yeah. 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 The, 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 the error would, would be, trying to do that, do that thing. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes into this next question. Um, h- how much of like happy was like yours and how much was like Noah Hawley's writing? Like what was kind of the process of like kind of meshing the two even like, what was that like, or, or did you stay pretty closely to Noah Hawley's envision? I hope I, I, I got the gig because they saw something that they didn't expect. So, you know, to that end, um, I'm sure I brought just my imagination, which is, which is, which is what you have as an actor. You know, you have your, your, your intellect and your imagination, your uh, curiosity. Right. Those, those are those three things, I think. Um, but he'd written like really great writers. They create these great kind of sketches, you know, and, and if you're listening and you're watching, then you can kind of fill it in. And the, the, the better this sketch, the better, or the, 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 the more space you have. I kind of feel like the, the, the more, the more tight, you know, the writer is about what they want and expect. I see a lot of freedom in that. Yeah. Right. I don't feel, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I don't feel uh, you know, constrained in that because there are versions to everything. And so, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I may be just, uh, you know, nutty enough to kind of find some different versions of, 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 of what he wanted. And, uh, and I think that that happened, I got a very kind of um, email from uh, Scott Wilson and um, Enzo uh, the night before I shot. That's, you know, that, you know, that they're really happy to have me. And, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how often, uh, you know, uh, that happens, but it was very nice to get that. So, um, um, so I, I think I may have brought something to it. I, I mean, you know, you know I, have a, I have a pretty active imagination and that guy kind of reminded me, you know, I, I, mean, I talked a lot about kind of his lineage to slavery mm-hmm. because it's in the fifties. Right. So his family may have been, two generations removed and, you know, and, you know, sharecropping was still going on. Like my dad was a sharecropper in Mississippi in 1940s. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so I, I made a suggestion that the uh, stick, you know, that, you know, you know, they want him to have a cane. And I said, you know, uh, I think the cane should be kind of representative of sugar cane. Oh, which wow. might have been what, wow. what he worked back then or what his family worked. And so he wanted to have like, and so I, and so I, I mean, I made like, like little suggestions like that, like, you know, just kind of what, what that lineage is, but it was really based on what Noah had created. 
um, with this character. And I just said, okay, well, if you did this, then I think this goes along with this. You know, I'm a, I'm, I always want to give a writer and a director what they want. I'm not trying to, because it's not me, it's the character, you know? Right. I'm not trying to do me. Um, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit different than a happy, but there is, <laughs> but there is him in me so <laughs> Right. Right. <laughs> Right. I, I just want to, we, we didn't write this down, but I just wanted to touch on, uh, I don't know if you've seen the series yet, but, uh, there are a lot of like cutaways with like, kind of like mugshot type, um, type, uh, things like how, how was that? Like, uh, was there like a photo shoot day where like all the actors just, <laughs> just did that? And, uh, no, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was a, a, a photo shoot day and, and see, and my hair was much longer then. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I cut it after, after where it's growing back now, but, but, um, but yeah, but we did a whole photo shoot day and, you know, they had me prepped for it. Cause like, of course I didn't, I didn't have any of this either. So they just right. took everything away, uh, which is fine. But yeah, we did this whole thing and they had me do this thing for like a week before we did the shot where I was, you know, just kind of, um, uh, teasing my hair. Mm-hmm. right right uh, a degree um and uh and then we came in and i think it took like maybe an hour and a half to do all those shots and you know it was it, it was a bit it was tiring but it was fun i mean i, I mean uh, i never get tired you know when i'm working so but yeah so yeah it was like yeah and it was funny to, 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 it was really funny to see how that came out Mm-hmm. And did you know all the stuff that was written next to it, or did they no. just like add that in post? That's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they had that in post, and, and you know, and I was like reading it. I was like, yeah, wow. I mean, you know, like, like here's shit I didn't know about him. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the funnest part about this season. It's like there's so many times where you're like, oh, I gotta pause this shot and like read everything. Totally. Yeah, it was great because once I read it, I was like thinking to myself, well, I hope I captured all that. All those things mm-hmm. that they, all those things that they put there. I hope I, you know, I captured that. And it was something really great about wondering that, like, you know, uh, you know, I didn't have, um, I didn't have access to, to maybe the, you know, I didn't have access, to, you know, to this little bit of information. But hopefully, I got it right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I think we kind of want to discuss the, uh, you mentioned Sylvain earlier, but, um, Daniel's a big Sylvain fan. So I'll, I'll let him take this next question. Oh but, my uh, <laughs> God. He directed two of my favorite episodes of the season. And it, it was, I mean, the whole series, every episode has been so masterfully crafted and well orchestrated by every director that's, that's had the helm. But I thought particularly his direction stood out to me. So I immediately had to start doing my research on him and see what this guy was all about. And, a very sort of odd career doing sort of studio horror movies and then becoming like this auteurist uh, indie filmmaker as well. And then doing prestige TV. I'm curious just what it was like to work with him. You already talked about it a little bit, but what was, what was his process like? Yeah. Easy and very, very, but he's very, very technical. You know, like I did, the, I was doing this. Uh, I had happy doing this thing with uh, the cigar at the top of the scene. And and I do things, and I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, <laughs> I'm in the character. You know what I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to do it. And so he came and he asked me to, to, to like do it again. And I was like, "Well, what do you mean, brother?" And he was like, "Well, you did this thing, and you blew out the smoke." And, this, and he was so, uh, you know, specific about uh, about about when it was. And we did like two or three takes. And he's like, "No, that was too late." I was like, "Oh fuck." <laughs> 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 No, that was too early. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, um, um, but he knows um, really what he wants, and he can make this little tweak. Uh, but he also like kind of gives that space, gives you a lot of space to mm. to uh, to work. He's very, you know, I'm a patient guy, and so I would ask him, you know, anything else from me, and he'd be like, no. Nope. <laughs> 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 That's always a good thing. That's always a good thing, uh, but but I but I just uh, but I did have a chance to like sit and and like watch him set up those shots like I was talking about that earlier, and to just watch his setups. It's not something I don't think a lot of actors like you know a lot of actors like go back to their trailers or they sit over on the side and they wait for that. Um, I'm um, I'm like a six year old. I'm trying to like 
I'm trying to like see everything, you know, yeah. and to watch the way he sets up shots and like, it's almost like he can see the pieces on the uh, chessboard and, you know, and, and then he, and, but he'll make a move with a camera or he'll give it, he'll give a direction to a camera, uh, a B camera. Uh, Cause he already, you know, he's anticipating something else happening. You know, he's anticipating a, a hand or, you know, or, you know, he's, he's watched the other shots when, when an actor's moved um, a hand, like uh, happy moving his hand to the ashtray to put out the cigar, you know, he's, he's, he's already anticipating things. And so I, I really enjoy just watching him work um, when I wasn't in fr- when I wasn't there in front of the camera. It's just really kind of special to watch him, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, he'll read something that I that I send him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great collab. Get get a little reunion going between the two of you. <laughs> Dig that. Yeah, yeah. L- little French in there also. You got uh, it. Very, very <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm working on. Yeah. And uh, kind of moving forward uh, through your through your last episode, um, talk 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 to us about kind of like what the what the death scene was like on the page versus like shooting it. And and you said you got to write some of Happy's monologue um, in that last scene. So well, yeah, just talk well, about I mean, that. You know, they didn't use that part, which is okay. Oh. Which, which which is okay. Um, no, um uh, um uh, um um. Enzo had sent over um, this monologue, but the intent, the intent of the monologue was just to have Happy talking when the gunshots came in to, to, you know, to kind of ring. And when I got to the set, I was like, Enzo. I mean, because I never met him. We met him, we chatted, I said, so Enzo. Um, I kind of worked on this a little bit. Uh, you know, you know, can I, you know, you guys mind if I try something? And they were very, very um, willing and open, and um, and uh, so I did the monologue, and then in between shots, he came up to me. He was like, "Hey, you know what? Let's let's write a, let's write a little bit more." And then there was this one line that he couldn't that we didn't really kind of mesh at the very end, and so I made a suggestion for. The line he said, "Yes, that's the line. So let's keep that." And I said, "Okay, cool." And then, uh, and and then, and then it was funny because I must have misunderstood because uh, what the direction was from uh, Dana, who uh, Dana Gonzalez, who uh, directed the final episode, mm-hmm. was was that uh, Happy looks up and he, and he's like, "Oh shit." But I said, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, really, I really think that's what it was, but I just kept doing it. I was like, well, you know, let's just keep doing it. Um, uh, but I think, but I, I think that was one of those happy accidents yeah. that kind of happened, and they allowed it to stay of um, a kind of fitting way, you know, of happy's of, 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 on the ending it's a very it's it's a very coen brothers ending in a lot of ways just someone's last words being oh shit and then again, getting blown away again which is what i was always thinking i'm like okay i know what they i know what they like to, i know how they like to move things you know <laughs> um um uh um that last look that steve uh Bushimi gives right before, you know, he's it's just kind of like that same thing so it's kind of, so um, um but i don't think you've kind of seen that happened before mm-hmm. not like that like somebody's end being like like that like yeah know? oh um so i was like uh yeah so you know the, oh well, that was cool and um you know it was funny because i got to because uh chris and i we, we kind of uh you know connected very, very quickly um um um, <clears throat> um and to watch how he worked with 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 uh, Chris and with um uh, Jay Nicole Brooks who who plays his wife um, uh, um she's an old friend we did some 
we've done theater together in Chicago. Oh. And I hadn't seen her in like three years since I got back into the country. Um, and uh, to watch how he kind of sets, sets those moments. And, um, you know, the anticipation of what the, what the actors are going to do, which kind of giving everyone their, their moment. And he's really concerned with the story, not necessarily the one actor or the one uh, you know, person or the, the persona, uh, you know, personality of the, the one, the, the, the lead actor. He gives everyone, you know, just that kind of space to, to have a work. And I think, that's, I think that's something you kind of see throughout the series. Um, um, because um, um, Karen Aldridge, who, uh, I forget Karen's character. Uh, Karen and I worked together in, in Paris. Um, uh, and I haven't seen her since. And then I saw her on the show. She played, um, what's the character that uh, kills uh, a Malloy in the, in the end? Oh, um, Zelmar. Yeah, yeah, Zelmar. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, she played Zelmar. And so I, so I, I knew, I, I've known Karen as well, who's, you know, she's a really fine, fine, fine actor. Oh, well, I'd go anywhere to work with her. Yeah, I, I mean, she she stood out for us this season a lot. We we really liked uh, what she brought to the table this season. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. The the, the 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 two of us didn't really. I mean, we got along initially, but eventually, you know, we didn't get along. Mm. But I tell people all the time. I say, I don't care where I am. If anyone says, "Would you like to work with Karen Aldrich?" I don't care. I'm going. I'm there. I w- I would. I jump into a box and they also work with her. She's just an amazing talent. That's incredible to hear. Yeah, the whole season was full of just amazing actors from all over the country and all over the world. And I love to hear the the way that you talk about the way that everybody on the team like really respected and gave freedom to the actors. I think that, like you said, it definitely comes through. It's definitely one of the reasons why we love Fargo. It, you can feel that that openness and that that. It, it feels a lot like theater in some aspects. Like there's a real openness to the actor as opposed to like being super technical, which it also is. But the, the way that the actor is actually given agency on the show seems to, to be one of the big reasons why the performances are so strong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that has, that's a testament to um, what Owen Noah has kind of uh, crafted. Um, no matter what, you get to see these folks that you haven't seen or, or you haven't seen a lot of, or people in the theater, you know, have seen a lot of. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and so he gives that opportunity to, to just kind of, you know, it's just so evident in, in each season. I, I think, Dan, we'll move away from Fargo at this point, just because I, I feel like we covered pretty much anything. I, I guess our last question for you would be like, um, like, what was your reaction to the season? Have you seen all of it yet? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, cool, yeah. What'd you think? Yes. Some people might think that it's disjointed by accident. Mm-hmm. I think it's disjointed on purpose. And I think that's one of the charms of it. That's what I really loved about it. Um, uh, whatever the intention was, it was like, it was a beautifully, you know, disjointed. And uh, I really like that about it. Uh, you couldn't just sit in one in 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 one storyline forever. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, I didn't like the fact that um, uh, 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 Doctor Senator got killed so early because I wanted to work because I wanted to work with us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, but but I, but I guess but I guess maybe uh, Happy is like you know the. Uh, the inverse of Dr. Senator. So, so, <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was, it's really beautifully shot. I love the, uh, I loved um, episode nine, uh, the uh, homage to uh, the Wizard of Oz, just the way that that was done. Um, and um, I, I don't. I don't think there always has to be such a payoff for the audience. I think the audience has to do some has to do some work, and I think and and I think this season forced the audience to do a lot of work. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, so we still to watch. Yeah, I mean, we discussed it uh, like off mic all the time, but like how 
we're really happy we started reviewing Fargo with this season because this season is a lot more interesting to discuss than the other ones. Just because, like you, you were saying, how disjointed it is, how many different characters there are, how many, like, again, homage is like Wizard of Oz. It's like a lot of people felt like angry that that didn't really go anywhere, but I, I thought it was like beautifully made. And I, I feel like television doesn't just like, like hang out anymore. You know, they they always have to be like getting something or doing something, but like this season of Fargo really hung out and, and, and that was just so nice to see and refreshing really. Yeah. 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 I have a million questions. If there's anything else, Tyler, that you want to talk about Fargo related, just let me know. But I, I'm so interested in your theater career. Uh, I mean, let's, we have a bunch of questions about it and about some specific projects that you've worked on, but I guess just take us to the start. Was it, was it theater that you initially fell in love with theater acting or maybe writing? What, what was the first passion? Uh, I started acting when I was 12 because, uh, that's where the girls were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the only reason I, that's the only reason I cared about it. <laughs> and I, and I think that what, what I, I started, started taking you seriously when I was 14, uh, I was an athlete then I was in a really bad car accident um, uh, that broke my pelvis and crushed my ankle. They wanted to cut my foot off, uh, twisted my knee. I was just really kind of mangled up as a kid. And, um, you know, I still played ball, uh, baseball and basketball, but I wasn't going to be, you know, the athlete that I thought I was headed towards being. And, you know, I, you know, I thought I, I – um, I started taking uh, acting more seriously when I was like 14. And then I got my first paycheck as an actor when I was 16. Uh, 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 I've never, I didn't study theater. Mm. Uh, I've never had an acting class I, uh, outside of like a year and a half, like high school. Um, um, but I've kind of grown up in the theater. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this summer, of 2021 will be uh, 40 years mm. in the theater. Um, uh, uh, this is how it's supposed to look. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, and uh, uh, just and uh, the piece I did in Boston was my 103rd uh, production. God, that's that's so impressive to have such a, a long career in theater because so many actors they they pursue theater as a career and they get chewed out but the fact that you've been kicking for this long and doing that many productions is is quite remarkable yeah i, I think i oh uh, I, I think it, i don't know if it would have happened had i had i turned had i not turned my nose up at tv and film early on because mm-hmm. i said i'm a theater actor um that's what i do i wasn't it wasn't so much turning my maybe I said that's the wrong verbiage i just i was just dedicated to really doing uh theater and so uh, a lot of opportunities went by, I guess. But but then I can say, you know, I tell people all the time that you have to kind of uh, uh, define success, uh, you know, for yourself first. Yeah. And I think, and, yeah, and I think I've been pretty uh, almost successful. Yeah. As far as, you know, no, as far I as mean, the definitely. And just in general, I feel like theater is very, like, close to your heart because – just in general you can't see it ever again really like it 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 happens and then it leaves it's it's similar to life it's just like it happens then it goes and there's no rewatching it you can't rewatch like your first show you know just because it and it's kind of beautiful but also kind of sad yeah yeah (laughs) yeah definitely yeah especially like right now in in covid um in covid times it it seems impossible i i I did a production like in february right before quarantine happened and uh it was my first play in like three years and i I, again i was like enjoying every moment of it and then now after the pandemic and stuff i'm like ah i wish i enjoyed it a little more you know what'd you do Um, i did a peter and the star catcher uh Oh, Peter and Starcatcher. Yeah, yeah, I played a sm- Smee in it. Yeah, um, uh, um, uh, I read for the original, and I was, I was, um, I was right there at the very end. Ah, oh, nice. You know, yeah, but yeah, yeah, the, uh, the original. I guess this was like two thousand eight. Yeah, it's a great show. Uh, may I ask who you read for? Um, 
uh, I forget the character's name. It was like the main character, I think. Oh, okay, cool. characters. I forget That's awesome. Name. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, yeah, kind of going off that, I guess. Um, so it seems like acting slash like sports at the beginning where it was your first passion. When did like playwriting come into your life um, and writing in general? Well, see, my brother tells me that he always said I was going to be a writer. He was like, you know, you wrote so much as a kid and then after my mom passed, she got all this information. He had all this stuff and she had saved a lot of writing that I'd done. I was like, I don't remember writing this as a kid. And he thought I, would, I was going to be a writer. And it was funny because I never saw a path to a livelihood as a writer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I was like 16, I was like, I was like, I was like, you know, I see anybody make a living as a writer. I mean, I mean you know, I could make a living, you know. Of course, as an actor, I was like, of course, of course. <laughs> exactly, right? I was like, of course, I can make a living as an actor, but as a writer. Uh, um, but then I went through some different uh, iterations. Like, um, um, I was a stand-up comic for about, uh, you know, for about seven and a half years. Um, when I wasn't in the theater, I was in, I was in the comedy clubs. And people, that, people in the comedy world didn't know I was a straight actor. <laughs> in the theater world didn't you know I was doing stand-up but but then I got to New York and I was like well I came to New York to act so let's go back to just kind of putting that back into what you do because I, I did improv and I did a lot of uh of just uh, of writing in that way early on uh um but I began to write for the stage uh I guess in 99 mm. uh and, you know and my thing was like you know you can't wait for someone to like give you work so you you have to create work of yourself of your own, and so I began to uh, really kind of uh, create work. And um, the first piece I wrote, uh, which is called uh, Knucklehead, um, ran for 128 shows mm-hmm. in uh, in um, uh, Brooklyn first, and it got moved to the 78th Street Theater Lab in New York City. Um, so from December to that next October. Uh, did 128 shows of that. It was a a solo piece, and you know my solo pieces are only one character. Right. I don't write them. Yeah, you know, I don't write like multiple character pieces, so they're like solo pieces. And so, um, yeah, then I began to just kind of really take on writing for the stage as I was as I was acting, uh, and uh, just really writing work for myself. Uh, a couple of pieces I wrote with, with, with like six, six characters in it, six actors. Then I, then I tore it down and wrote it as a solo piece with one, one character. That's pretty incredible with, uh, with, with how, how long that solo show ran. Yeah. But, 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 but I think, but I think it also kind of gives you um, respect for, for writers as well, because I've, I've never been the kind of actor that would just kind of bastardize a writer's work and cross out their punctuation or do some other things like that, you know, there's, there's a respect for it. And now, you know, as a writer, cause I, I, I also write for a, a, a screen now, um, um, whatever I do as an actor, I want to know how to do as a writer. Um, and so, um, you know, you just kind of, it, 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 it's just kind of a, an extension of what I do as an actor. Like, you, you know, you, you, uh, create these worlds in your head and now you're just creating these larger worlds of all the of all of all the characters of all the people that uh if that makes sense no yeah 100 percent. yeah is that even more maybe like therapeutic and rewarding when you're because like you said if you're just playing happy for example you're playing one character you're in that character's head but then as a writer you're able to get inside of everybody's head is that even more rewarding or do you find it just like a different type of rewarding sometimes i want to write more than i want to act mm. because there's something there's just something about creating as you said there's something about creating all of that you know just uh you know uh, creating the world and having such an affection for people like the creators of fargo like noah who's created this whole world and it's like wow that seems like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Uh, um, um, and that, you, you know, cause sometimes it seems a bit limiting uh, as an actor. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It, it's all of that. It's, 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 it's not one or the other, I guess I, sh- I, sh- I should say it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's great. 
it's a great way of challenging uh, your imagination and, you know, uh, exploring your, your, your curiosity and also uh, being able to kind of uh, make a statement about certain things, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, you know, what does the world mean to right. you through these characters or, or how do you see the world at this, you know, at this juncture of history past? Yeah, as, as a writer, you get to leave maybe more of your individual footprint than you might as an actor, just because as an actor, you're serving another person's story usually, but as the writer, you're you're telling that story. I'm, I'm curious about, you said you started writing really in like 1999 for yourself. Was there a moment before that where where you just like maybe work was drying up that forced you into that position? Because like you said, you have to, you just can't wait on projects to come along. Was there a moment that that really spurred that? Yeah, I'm just really restless, you know, and um, uh, and I think I've been seeing a lot of solo work done. And then I was like, well, you know, you never get a chance to really kind of enjoy a character before the actor switches to another character. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to try my hand at it. So it was a bit, it was a bit of both. It was like, you know, I, mean, I don't know if work was drying up, but but you always go through like spells of you know of you know of of the the ebbs and flows of, of of your career, um, and so uh, a cat that I knew a uh, uh, director said, well, yeah, if you're gonna do a solo show, why don't you do something interesting? <laughs> you, know, you know, don't do the same kind of thing. And so I was like, well, okay, well, let's take one character. So I created a character called uh, Prejudice. Mm. And um, and I had him dead, but he's in you know purgatory. You know, of, of he can't rest. Mm. And so it was kind of based on like a series of poems that I had written, and I'd written all these poems. And my collaborator at the time just told me, she said, "Okay, just lay the poems out in the in the floor." And I said, "Okay." And so I laid out all these poems, and she said, "Okay, well, pick them up in the form of a story." And so I began to do that. And then from that, I was able to, you know, with her help, just to kind of like craft this story of this guy who's got to paint a wall. That's his job, you know. <laughs> and, and whenever he leaves and he comes back, the wall's been painted over again. So he's got to paint mm. it. And so he's not happy about it. And so, you know, and he's, and he's telling this story, you know, to the audience and it's, you know, cathartic. And so by the time he reaches the, the end and he's kind of let out his soul, mm -hmm. he thinks that's going to, that's going to allow him to kind of leave and at least die, at least rest. But he doesn't get the rest even then because has he really learned the lesson? Right. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Is that, is that, uh, was that like a, a, have you tried that process at other times writing poetry, especially because you said you had done work as a stand up comic. Did that process writing poetry, doing stand up? did that help doing solo shows as well? And, and did you do that going forward as well? It, it, it did. It did. Um, uh, all those things like, you know, I, I did, I did improv uh, and sketch comedy first. So I was writing that back in, in Houston where I'm from and um, at, at, at a place called the comedy workshop. And um, on the other side was uh, the annex, which is where the stand-up comics were. Mm -hmm. And so when the workshop closed down, I was like, I got to keep, I got all this energy. I got all this creativity in my head. So I went over to the annex and I was the only actor that the comics liked because they hated the actors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Classic. Oh, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was then, I mean, you know, I met, you know, great people like you know, um, uh, the late uh, Bill Hicks, uh, mm. uh, uh, Sam Kennison, you know, mm. they're from Houston. Um, uh, uh, Janine Garofalo was down there at the time. Um, uh, um, uh, Thea uh, Vidal. Uh, mm -hmm. Just some really, really great talents. Uh, um, uh, uh, Arsenal and Mitchell, who we went to high school together with, they were a comedy team. And uh, and then I started to do that. And so I think all of that gave me kind of an idea of kind of how, of even how to how to how to like structure a story because your structure is set that same way. And, you know, you watch Chappelle and you see how how he's able to kind of structure a story. And um, so when I began to write. You know, I began to just um, utilize those past experiences to kind of uh, craft, kind of stand up in a theatrical kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Because, 
you know, seeing someone slip on ice is funny, but you slipping on the ice is not funny at all. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So I got to watch like, you know, this character prejudice, you know, you mm-hmm. know, who's basically every man, right? Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, to some degree, um, uh, we all have our prejudices. Um, you know, I, get to, I got to watch him slip on this ice. Mm. But I also got to understand more. And what was the name of that show? Was it just the character's name? Or? Anatomy of a Knucklehead was the name of the piece. Oh, okay. that, Great title. Great title. Yeah, because that was, that, was, that was the first poem I picked up. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, k- kind of going off this, great to hear about that project, really. Um, we'd also like you to discuss uh, The Seven, uh, which you won an Obie Award for, uh, where you played Oedipus, um, and then Turn Me Loose, where you played uh, someone who you really looked up to, uh, D- Dick Gregory. We can get into Dick Gregory a little bit later. but uh, you, you guys have done such research. That's very, that's, that's very, that's very kind of you. Of course, of course. We, we, we really wanted to interview you and uh, hear everything. I, I mean, just with our backgrounds and stuff, it's so cool to, to hear about your background in stand-up and improv and acting and now writing. It's, it's a lot of fun for us. Um, and, and going off that with those two projects, like, how does playing like, uh, like an actual person like dick gregory compared to like some fictional characters like oedipus who who does have like a pretty robust classical history um but it's it's still a fictional character and and as well as the one you you created yeah well well you know uh um in the seven well uh in the seven against thebes uh oedipus is already dead Mm -hmm. so 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 he's already died what uh will power my uh, dear friend and the writer of the seven did was he brought Oedipus back as kind of this looming force over the over 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 uh, Ateocles and Polynices, the uh, brothers, t- to make them battle each other. Mm. And um, <clears throat> it's funny because uh, I knew Will because I had done. He's from the uh, Fillmore district in, in San Francisco. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, and so I had done a, a short play of his when he was still out there. I did a short play of his in New York. Then I happened to be doing a play at PS one twenty two. PS one twenty two. Then I heard this guy Will Power was doing a show downstairs in the other theater. I was like, "Is that the same Will Power?" So I went down, and he's like, "Hey, man, you did my show." And so that's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how that's how that's how the two of us met. Then about five years later, we ended up moving to the same small town just outside of New York City. Mm-hmm. And people kept asking me, hey, do you know a guy named Will Power? And it's like a really small town. And I was like, yeah. And he said, yeah, and I think he knows you. But we hadn't seen each other. Then one day on the train platform, we saw each other. And he said, hey, man, I'm doing this show at New York Theater Workshop called The Seven. You should read for it. And I went in to read, and uh, Joe Bonney, um, um, who's married to, um, uh, she's a very fine director. She's married to um, uh, um, uh, Erica Spagosian. Um, 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 and so Joe was directing it. And so I went in to read for it. I went in, I read for it. And originally I was just supposed to be the uh, workshop Oedipus because they didn't want to make me part of the chorus. They were like, he's not a chorus. He's bigger than that. And, um, one thing led to another and they ended up making me the first order of business when they decided to go into, uh, production to, to play Oedipus. And uh, cause I'd made some, it was really a cameo role. And I began to kind of like, you know, I like to say, I don't really play roles that kind of uh, grow them now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we grew this character from a cameo to really this, you know, looming force over the brothers. So um, it's kind of the same process, you know, um, Oedipus, <clears throat> I, I made some uh, suggestions about, um, certain verbiage in the uh in the piece i suggested that not everybody use a certain word in the piece that only oedipus should 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 use that word because if he oh. uses the word then we then we've been dealing with even a larger lineage of where of where like language how language is passed down mm-hmm. right. and where that word came from and how he keeps that word on his sons Mm-hmm. And, you know, so like every time, uh, 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 
every time he comes on stage, the first thing he says, he says, niggas, do y'all know who y'all fucking with? <laughs> <laughs> I am Oedipus. And so, like, you know, but like everybody was saying it originally. And I said to Will, I said, Will, I don't think it's having the effect that you wanted to have if everybody's using it. If only Oedipus uses it. And it's a word that I don't use, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't let anybody call me that in jest. I don't let anybody call me that otherwise. And I don't call anybody else that. Um, um, but for the character, it was important that only that character uses the word. And I think that kind of like, that opened the piece up a bit, you know, because then we get to see this, these extreme sides of him, side that's really kind of, that's, that's like angry that he's dead and is keeping all of this rage on his sons and his other part that we see where it's coming from because of what happened with him in his life being left and, and, you know, and being given to, you know, two other people. And then, um, uh, um, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and his father Leas. So, so yeah, so, um, um, so it was cool to kind of dig into that. And with Turn Me Loose, I, you know, uh, um, I had a choice of five episodes on the shy, Mm. in season two yeah. or going to play someone that I've loved since I was a kid. So I went to go play someone I loved as a kid. That's a beautiful choice. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I, and I think, and, and I think there, the difference was that I wanted to just let Baba Gregory kind of find me. I didn't want to try and do him because you can't, do that I think the best you can do and I played a couple of characters that are like actual people and my 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 process with that is to just say the words and you know that spirit will find you I know it sounds really uh esoteric but um but but that's what I did with um uh uh, um, uh Dick Gregory and um his kids were even like you know wow you were my father Oh, that's got to be so good to hear. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, and um, um, we ended up selling that show out. Uh, this is, you know, just me on stage for about an hour and forty minutes. No, there's another actor on stage, but he's only there for maybe about five minutes of the show max. Five, yeah, five minutes of the show max. But we did. We played a 510 seat theater in um, uh, at the Arena Stage in DC, and uh, we. Um, um, extended the show before the first uh, preview week was over. Wow. So, yeah. So, uh, so I did think I did like 60, 60 shows of that. And, and every night, I mean, there were some nights even that there were some nights that I thought I was going to faint on stage because there was, but because whatever was happening was not happening with me. And I thought I had to loosen my tie a couple of nights and some and people that may have seen the show that are hearing this will probably be like, Oh, that's why he did that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I was struggling because there was some other things that was like working through me. And it's kind of when you let yourself just open yourself up to whatever the spirit of that person is, you know, they'll find you. And, and I got that role because I was, I got a phone call from uh, Jack Doolin in New York and uh, Joe Morton, the uh, great Joe Morton. Uh, he couldn't do the show anymore. And I got a phone call just offering me the role. Uh, they say, you know, your name keeps coming up. Um, <laughs> and would you be interested in coming to do it? And I was like, well, you know, how could I not do it if it comes to you this way? But um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, shout out to uh, Elwood Reed, uh, who, uh, who uh, you know, who understood, you know, he was he was showrunner on the show at the, at the time. Did you go? Did you go back to him and say like, eh, could I could I maybe get the the part again like next season or on the on the next show? <laughs> well, well, you know what, he he left the show by then, but but we we did end up chatting when I was in Michigan. We ended up chatting, and I asked him off the cup if he would read a couple of uh, pilots that I had created, and he was like, he only knew people only, people only know me as an actor. They don't know me really as a writer, mm-hmm. and so he was like, uh, yeah, okay. And so he read them and he called back and he was like, and, and he sent me a note saying, you know, you, uh, you have time to chat, you know, you, you know, you know, let's talk about this, this stuff that, that, that you're writing, you know, do you mind if I show it around, around LA? Cause I think it's really good. So, you know, 
so it all kind of worked out. So, so now we kind of have a relationship again. <laughs> That's good. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I have one more question about Dick Gregory. Um, cause uh, I mean, it, it seems like when I was, I was looking up some, some doing some research about you, it seems that this was a person that was kind of a big influence on you since you were pretty young. You seem to be, um, a big fan of his. I'm curious if, like how much research did you do on him as opposed to like how much you already knew of him? And then, like you said, you, you can't really just do an impression of this guy who is so famous and so iconic and so uniquely spirited. Um, but just how you, how you figure that out a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, notoriously, I don't do research on characters. That's kind of one of my things. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, I think even if a script is bad, everything the actor needs is in the script. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, if I go out and I watch blah, 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 and I come back and I do it, I'm not doing this. I'm doing that. And I'm not serving the, the writer nor the story, right? Um, um, what I did with Turn Me Loose was that the only research I had was that in the rehearsal room, there were these pictures of him asked all over the all over the, uh, the the room all over the rehearsal room and I just walk up to the pictures and just look at them that's really all I did I was it was look at all these pictures from these different moments these different times because I was playing Dick Gregory as a younger comic in, and as a, an old I was playing him in in those the year before uh, uh, he passed away as well <laughs> Um, but that's, that's the most that I did it. There were, there were just, there were, there were about 40 pictures and I would just look at these pictures every day, you know, on every break, mm. I'm, you know, I wouldn't take them home with me because I think, you know, actors should be able to just kind of take off that and, you know, you know, enjoy a, a, a cigar and some scotch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, 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 and, but I, that's, that's what I use. And that, that's, a, that's the source material that I had that, and just, you know, what I knew about him, you know, you know, how I knew that he affected me. And I had to, I told the writer and the uh, director at one point, I said, you know, this story is not really even about Dick Gregory. It's about brown skinned men of African descent who have to make a choice between truth and their livelihood. Mm. Because this guy left millions of dollars on the table. He didn't have to. All those things, like meshing all those things to take all those things with me and just um, knowing that there's a posture that, that the comics have in the 60s. There's a posture that he had you know, when you, when you wear a suit and tie, you know, there's a posture, you know, you can't, you know, I was always, I thought, I mean, uh, Bill Cosby is this guy that, you know, along with him and Red Fox and Richard Pryor, that, that always just kind of influenced me as well. And, but, but there's a way that, that, that you carried yourself. And so uh, I felt because of my stand-up experience, I was like, you never know what you're doing that you're going to need later. And, you know, all the solo work that I had written. You just never know what exactly. And so, you know, you, you can't, uh, you know, uh, quantify how much time it's going to go by that, that, you know, that are, you're going to need these skills that, are, that, are, that you've acquired. And I knew that no other comic had, would have the ability to kind of understand dramatically what happens in real time and no actor would really kind of understand the comic timing that's needed to tell jokes in this way, just standing there with a microphone. Right. Right. I, I mean, I mean, overall, it really seems like that's like a, an accumulation of your entire career, just like with the stand up, the acting, the writing, the solo work, it, it must've been very, um, very nice to, to sell that out and uh, extend it in previews, uh, especially. It was the one moment, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it was the it was one moment that I was like, 
okay, now I can go and do TV and film. Mm. Or, I mean, not that I hadn't done it already. But, I mean, I mean, you know, yeah. I'd already had what they do doing the Law and Order stuff, and had a character on there for three episodes, and mm. uh, and doing some other film work. But as you said, that that culmination, it brought together everything I'd done in my entire career. You know, the um, uh, my uh, my uh, you know my politics as an actor, as mm. well, because I have a very big issue with the theater and the politics. You know, they say that they are very uh, inclusive and they're very um, uh, open, but, they're v- but, it, but it's very, it's also very uh, conservative. So now it's just like, okay, now is the time to really kind of dive headlong into writing and, and into, um, uh, into um, uh, acting on camera even more because, you know, you know turn me loose, you know, turn me loose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, that's actually a good, great transition into our last, uh, little segment here. And, uh, yeah, let, let's talk about that transition. Cause you, you, you were, you were very, um, focused on theater for the first half of your career. And, uh, what kind of changed your mind about TV and film, um, including like turn me loose, obviously. And like, what, what has that transition been like? I think what I realized is, wow, I get to use my muscle in a whole different way now. I understand what happens, you know, in this little space, in this camera, you know. I Okay, now I get it. It's not just about posturing and this and that, which is why I was kind of always against it. I, think it, I didn't think it required very much from me. Mm-hmm. Um, because I always want to give as much as I can. And then I was like, oh, wow, okay. I'm, I started doing more. I started doing a little bit of film in like 2003. 2002, 2003, and then did more and more. But then I started to see, okay, yeah, it's beginning. I'm beginning to understand how to use my, my muscle better. Uh, because it's actually more difficult for me to memorize lines when I'm doing TV and film that I'm doing a play. Yeah. Same, same here. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> uh, 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 and I, I understand now why, because, you know, it's, it's almost like um, uh, theaters, a shouting match and TV and films, a whisper. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and so I'm learning more and more how to whisper allowed because now i'm finding um, you know that uh, pendulum swings and you start learning more and more about it and um so it's 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 been it's been a great way of utilizing my my muscle in a different way well yeah i think to speaking on that it's it's it definitely is different muscles for me acting in theater is more i just for me personally it's more of an emotional process like i feel more emotionally fulfilled at the end of a theater performance than i do with film or you know i mean the, the like the short films that we do um because i think theater it's a bit more emotional and internal and then theater and then film is more um it's more logical it's more like a puzzle and so it's just a different part of your brain that you're activating yeah 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 you have to realize kind of what what your job is um like when i'm sitting across from uh, marishka harkate doing the scene my job is to provide the audience with the information that she needs. Not, not, not to provide her with the information, but, but provide the audience with the information that she needs. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of, it's um, with theater, you know, you're doing this. And sometimes with TV and film, you have to bounce it off the audience so that it comes back, just, just so that, that they can stay involved in it. Like, I realize now kind of what my job is given given what what character uh i'm doing there um, totally I, th- there's a sense of like we talk about this concept every now and then there's a sense of instant gratitude when you're doing theater or you're performing stand-up or you're doing improv but like with with film it, it is really like you have to in a way pretend that the crew's like all really engaged in watching you like an audience would, you know, and it's, uh, it's difficult. 
But, you know, when you can get them to do that, when they say cut and you walk by the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the camera and, and she says, wow, that was great. You know, I mean, she's looking through it and it may not even be on her, but she's not even looking at her camera. She's watching. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you kind of know that you're kind of affecting. Well, we'll jump to this question uh, just because we're, we're probably close to wrapping up. Um, how, just because it's such a big topic, you've probably talked it to death, but we just kind of want to touch on it since it's on everyone's mind, like for the last nine months, like how has COVID-19 affected your career? Um, like just in acting and, and basically the industry as a whole. And, uh, how do you think it will kind of change the industry going forward? Well, uh, Elwood would have never sent me a messenger. No, I mean, he would not have had the time to read my scripts had COVID not happened, you know? So it's like, you know, it's terrible that it's affecting and it's harming so many people. Artistically, it's helped because now there are people in LA that know me as a, a writer and he's championing, he's championing that, mm-hmm. which, which, which wouldn't have happened because, because you know, he, he just wouldn't have had the time. You know, this doesn't happen um, 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 if not for the past nine months, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, uh, the uh, three of us here may, may not happen the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, I was happy that LA streets were not so crowded. You know, you can see how really, you can, you can really see how beautiful LA really is when there aren't so many cars on the road. When the yeah. smog all cleared and you could actually <laughs> see the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 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 Um, so, um, I mean, I hate to kind of say that it hasn't, that I hate to say that it's done some good for me because of all the terror that it's wreaked on, on everyone else. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's helped me uh, as a writer mm-hmm. uh, and as an actor, you know, moving this back was perfect timing for me, I think as well, uh, because now it comes out at the end of the year and pilot season starts next month. So there's still kind of that heat kind of thing. So, you know, it's, it's how you look at things. Yeah, definitely. That, that's a great answer. And uh, I mean, just to touch on uh, us, not that interesting, but I, <laughs> I don't, I don't think our pot, <laughs> I, I don't think our podcast would have happened uh, if, if Fargo came out in April, like it was originally planned um, because for us, we were both graduating college at the time. And that is like my workload would have been way different um, compared to what it was like in September. So uh, again, a lot of horrible stuff has happened, but sometimes you got to look at that silver lining and uh, move forward and be, be grateful that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I might've been back in Paris by now, or I might've been down in Mexico on the living, you know, uh, but um Either way, you know, it's you know, you just uh, you just look at at how it it it, it helps, mm-hmm. how it's assisted you. You know, uh, I mean, you know, what do you do with the lemons? You know, it's it, it's been good. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, what are you guys working on next? What what's, what's, what's <laughs> the next for Daniel? <laughs> what can we look for? What can we look for? Q and us. Queuing us up perfectly. Oh my wow, goodness! Wow, that's w- wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you could be our official hype man for every podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just in general, I think we're working on this channel. We we have a lot of reviews coming out for things, um, but yeah, we, we did work on a short film. Uh, not exactly sure where we're going to put it out. I'm actually looking at footage after this podcast with Daniel. Um, but yeah, you know. I, I think I can speak for both of us when I say we're we're gonna keep creating and uh, and trying different things and uh, actually I, I think this is kind of funny I'll just announce it now we're gonna for the next twelve years uh, starting <laughs> <laughs> in January we're gonna watch twelve minutes of the film Boyhood uh, we both haven't seen it and it's the movie that took twelve years to make uh, so for every year from twenty twenty one 
to 2033, we're going to review uh, 12 Minutes of Boyhood. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> anything else? Yeah, so look out for that. That's going to be some hot piping content coming right down, <laughs> right down the pike for you. <laughs> nice. No, go on. Well, what else? Yeah. Uh, well, you know. Well, 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 well. Then, um, uh, you know, we'll we'll, we'll look out. We'll, we'll look out uh, for that. And it's so wonderful to have you guys on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is the Edwin Lee Gibson podcast. Now he turned the tables on us. <laughs> Um, but, but again, we'll, we'll for sure be keeping in contact with you. We definitely want to hear about everything you're doing. Um, if you ever want to come back on the show, we'd love to have you. Um, uh, if sure. you, yeah, if you have like a TV show you're reviewing or something, we'd love to have you on to talk about it. Not would, of course. I'm <laughs> all, you, you know what? The moment that happens, I will do my best to give you guys the first, uh, interview or at least the first podcast i mean i'll do my i'll do my best there's some there's there's some things that are in the works and um um some people thought that happy well they wanted happy to be there on the show longer and more uh which 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 which, which is which is very nice but you know uh, uh it was it was it was good enough for for me well it's never good enough for me but it was it was necessary that that it was where it was and so i'm very thankful to uh noah and to um uh Savan, Chris, and uh, 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 and so you know, by having me on, and I'm a Rachel Tenor, I should say. I've never, I've never, I've never met Rachel Tenor who cast oh. the show. But, oh, interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I actually, actually sent her a note saying I know we've never met, but I wanted to thank you for having me. On. Uh, <laughs> That's really sweet. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah, and um, um, and um, yeah, and if you guys are looking for scripts, I sent you something. Absolutely. We, we would love to read your scripts, really. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely send you a cut of our short film if it comes out good. <laughs> oh, please. Please do. Yeah. Yeah, please do. But again, thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, this has been a true podcast. Uh, I've been Tyler. I've been Daniel. And uh, special guest Edwin Lee Gibson. You, you can say the last word. Daniel thinks he's slick, but I know he's got a, 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 a boom over his head. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's I, right. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Right yeah. yep. <laughs> see, I knew it. I knew it. See, see I, I'm a, I told you I'm like a six year old. I'm like a six year old. I'm like watching every. I was like, <laughs> incredible. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, but, but, um, thank you both for having me and, uh, really, uh, joy to like listen to your take on, uh, Fargo and just, um, um, they were just, you know, constructive and, uh, insightful and funny. And, um, your banter is really, really, it's really, really it, it's, it's difficult to kind of find a, you know, a teammate like that. So, uh, you know, kudos to you guys. Thank you so much, Edwin. All right, young fellas, stay yeah. up and stay at it. You too. You too. You too, Edwin.